So this is the uh, Bertolette sawmill. It's an original 18th century sawmill. It's not original to the Daniel Boone homestead, however. It was moved here in the late 1960s from a site over in Ole, about seven miles from here. As the name suggests, it was originally built by a family named Bertolette. There's still a lot of Bertolettes living in Ole. Um, it's another branch of the same family that owned uh, our Bertolette log house, which can also be seen here at the homestead. Um, it is 100% water powered. The, we have a five acre lake up here with a dam breast and a valve in the dam, which we opened this morning, which filled this channel of water over here, which fills our tank. And the tank is the key to the power that we need to run the mill. The tank is 10 feet deep. And we're tapping water using this mechanism. We're tapping water off the bottom of the tank with a large gate valve. Um, when we, when I move this lever forward, it's going to cam. Or you've already actually already, probably already seen Jeff doing that. When you move this lever forward, this rack and pinion will move this timber up, which raises the valve at the bottom of the tank. That opens a slot about six inches high or so and it's uh, four or five feet wide. It's about as wide as our water wheel. And that slot that opens up is directly in line with the bottom vein on the water wheel. So the water comes out at high velocity, hits that bottom vein on the wheel and knocks the wheel backwards, which is why this type of wheel is often called an undershot wheel or a flutter wheel. It's a little bit different from the overshot wheel you'll see on a grist mill or uh, another mill where the mechanism moves very slowly, you'll see water coming out of a, a raised race and dumping on top of an overshot wheel. It fills buckets on the wheel and slowly turns the wheel forward. Um, this is a completely different system and we're reliant on water pressure, which is why our tank is 10 feet deep. So when that wheel starts spinning, it turns. it's mounted on an iron axle that's sort of longitudinally aligned with the, with the mill. So the wheel would actually be down directly below me here and turning uh, from your perspective in a clockwise fashion. That is mounted on an iron shaft. The shaft is attached to a, an arm, an offset arm called a pitman arm. It's very similar to the, the arm you'll see running the wheels on a steam locomotive, only instead of running uh, horizontally, it's running vertically in this case. And the top of that pitman arm is attached uh, with a toggle to the bottom of this wooden frame or sash. Um, a lot of times this is referred to as a sash sawmill. This sash is going to start moving up and down in the same fashion as a window sash. And the blade, our vertical cut saw blade, is simply stretched right down the center of this sash. And, uh, there's yokes at the top and the bottom, and it's just tightened with some nuts there. As the sash starts moving up and down, there's a toggle here, which is attached to a long arm. In the, in the video of the mill running, you'll see this arm uh, bouncing up and down, and that causes this rocker over here to rock back and forth which powers this arm, which powers another seesaw type rocker. And that rocker is going to power these two arms over here, which have little iron hands or paws on the ends of them. These are called escapement arms. These are the escapement hands. And they're very much like the escapement hands you'll see in an old fashioned uh, uh, mechanical clock movement. If you've over opened up the case on a clock, you can see little escapement hands that are moving the gears around uh, that move the hands on the dial of the clock. And these are doing pretty much the same job. They're just going to start pushing one notch forward. Every time the blade goes up and every time the blade goes down, these hands are going to push one notch forward on this iron track. And that's going to make this large wheel, which is called a rag wheel, W-R-A-G. The rag wheel is going to start slowly turning forward. That's mounted on this hub which has an iron shaft in the middle of it running down the center of it and there are two cogged gears underneath the carriage that are going to start slowly turning forward. 
And what all of this mechanism does is as the blade's moving up and down, this is just going to feed the carriage and the log into the blade. And that's what's going to uh, generate our cut and cut a board off. And if everything goes right, you set it up and start the mill and that blade will just run the full length of the log and cut one board off. And then you've got to set up again for your next cut. As I said, uh, the mill is an original 18th century mill. When they started building these mills here in the colonies, they would have looked pretty much exactly like this one. It's very typical of a mid 18th century sawmill. And this technology wasn't developed here. It was developed in Europe, probably in the Germany or Switzerland areas. You can see a lot of clock making influence in the drive mechanism. Um, when they started building mills, they would have looked pretty much like this. And prior to this type of mill being built, or before this technology was available here, uh, every single board that you wanted for building a house or a barn or uh, planks for decking a bridge, every single one of those dimensioned pieces of lumber had to be cut by hand using a method called pit sawing. And in pit sawing, you literally dig a pit in the ground and you lay your log that you're gonna be cutting boards off of over the pit and you've got one guy down in the pit and another one standing up on top of the log, pushing and pulling on a whip saw all day. And so as you can imagine, that's kind of backbreaking labor. Uh, but not only is it very difficult and labor intensive, it's skilled labor. These guys were uh, tradesmen, they were skilled craftsmen, they were represented by uh, trade guilds, just the same as any other craftsman, and you would have to uh, do an apprenticeship, you would have to work as a journeyman. It took years to learn how to efficiently cut lumber. The average person couldn't just pick up a whip saw and start cutting boards and have anything that really looked like anything when they were done. So the great thing about this technology, uh, when it first arrived here in the colonies, when they started building mills like this along every waterway in the area really, uh, was it gave the opportunity for someone like me who's not a, a skilled pit sawyer, to actually cut useful dimension lumber. And of course, it, it increased productivity as well. Uh, we've done a few calculations. I think, by my best guess, over the course of an eight-hour day, a crew of two people, like we're using here, could produce probably 20 boards in an eight-hour day. So uh, I don't know how many... They say that the, the, the pit sawyers could cut about as fast as we're cutting wood here. Uh, the, the actual rate of the cut, about one foot per minute. Uh, but I don't believe they could have kept up that, that, uh, that pace of work over the course of an eight hour day the way you can with this when you've got water doing the work for you. A lot of mills like the Bertolette sawmill. This is a fairly small sawmill. It probably wasn't in everyday operation. It was located on a farm. Um, there, there were larger mills that were located along rivers and, and larger bodies of water that probably ran seven days a week. But uh, a mill like this was probably only run uh, when they had the water power to do it. A lot of times that would be during the spring runoff or in the summertime when you were having heavy rains and a farmer couldn't be out in the field, he could be on his mill, maybe producing some lumber. And in the 18th century, there was a real labor shortage here. When the Boones first moved here to the homestead in uh, around 1730, this was really the edge of the frontier. And there were a lot of people moving in, there was a lot of land that needed to be cleared, there, was a, there were a lot of trees that had to be cut into lumber uh, for new construction, but um, there weren't a lot of people already here to do the labor. So something like this was a, was a huge advantage um, to someone who's trying to productively produce lumber because you could literally sell every piece of lumber you could cut. You probably couldn't cut enough to meet the demand. As a matter of fact, there were um, merchants coming up from Philadelphia, which is only about 45 miles from here. Merchants were coming up from Philadelphia, which in the middle of the 18th century, was the second largest city in the British Empire, second only to London, and growing at an enormous rate. These merchants were coming up, they were buying every piece of lumber they could find, loading it in wagons, and shipping it right down to the city for new construction. So uh, this was just a great way for a farmer, or really anybody living on the frontier, to augment their income. And then of course, as I said, there were larger mills that were in full-time production that 
did nothing but cut wood.